Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Ancia, Editor for Health IT Outcomes, and I'm pleased to serve as moderator for today's webinar, How Leaders Effectively Manage Communications in a Connected Hospital. First, a little background. As technology continues to advance, the way healthcare is delivered is transforming along with it. From the point of care to payment and reimbursement, the hope is this transformation will improve patient outcomes as well as provider and payer effectiveness. Meeting the demands of this rapid healthcare evolution can be overwhelming, especially when ineffective communication exists between key stakeholders. One way to remove this major stumbling block, ineffective communication, is by implementing health IT. This strategy isn't revolutionary. In fact, the 26th Annual HIMSS Leadership Survey found three out of four respondents feel patient engagement, satisfaction, and quality of care will have the greatest impact on their organization over the next two years, and 81% that IT will be leveraged and play a major role in ensuring that the impact is positive. Additionally, two-thirds of those taking part in the HIMSS survey feel IT will further the triple aim by improving the patient health experience, and more than half feel IT will reduce the costs of health care and improve population health. What isn't revolutionary and can, do, and can do more harm than good when implementing the latest and greatest IT is neglecting to develop a unified communication strategy to create a connected hospital. By one definition, a connected hospital is one that is fully integrated and where wireless technology allows caregivers and patients to roam throughout the hospital while providing accurate and timely monitoring. For instance, connecting medical devices to EHRs can reduce the time it takes to enter vitals, a gained efficiency that will be crucial in providing quality patient care. RTLS will be used to quickly find usable equipment for treatments, and advanced bed and fall monitors can monitor patient movements and alert staff as soon as there is an issue. Ultimately, patient safety, data accuracy, and mobility will all be fueled by wireless technology. In a connected hospital, nurses can monitor many patients remotely from one main station, doctors can make more informed decisions with accurate and up-to-date patient information, and patients can feel safe. But effectively managing communications in a connected hospital is no easy task, which is why we're all here today. Today's webinar features Shahid Shah and Ahmad Moulin. Shahid, known as the Healthcare IT Guy, is a healthcare IT thought leader, and Ahmad is a recognized unified communications expert. Together, Shahid and Ahmad are prepared to give you actionable knowledge to create a connected hospital, better manage communications, and ultimately drive better outcomes. However, before I turn the stage over to these two experts, I have a few housekeeping items to address. First, we'll be leaving time at the end of today's webinar for a live Q&A. You could submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A module in the upper right-hand corner of your webinar interface. Any questions we aren't able to address, we'll answer via email. Next, one of the questions we most commonly receive is, can you get a copy of the slide deck? The answer is yes, and upon the conclusion of this webinar, an email will be sent to you uh, detailing that process. Now that those items are out of the way, I am pleased to turn things over to Shahid. Thanks, John. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, thank you for all the attendees uh, for uh, braving a summer day. Uh, I know you guys probably want to be doing some other exciting stuff, but uh, we'll try to make this uh, worth your while. I, I was really excited as uh, uh, Hit, Hit Outcomes and John especially uh, asked me to talk a little bit about uh, unified communications. Uh, and uh, and I was excited because there's so much going on in healthcare, and so much of it is directly related to how well we can get our participants within the healthcare ecosystem. Whether it's payers communicating with patients, or patients communicating with their physicians, and physicians communicating with other physicians and nurses and hospitals. So as we look at all of these different uh, uh, things that are coming up in healthcare, whether it's the Affordable Care Act, whether it's um, all the work around meaningful use. ICD-10 upgrades, almost everything that we do on a daily basis is directly determined by how well we communicate with each other, and that's why I thought this was a, a beautiful topic uh, to, to come up with on a, on a nice uh, sunny August day, uh, at least here in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm thrilled to bring uh, Imad Malin in on the conversation in a little while, but I wanted to kind of set the stage as to what we should be talking about with respect to communications in healthcare. And um, I I Imad, who is a, 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 an expert in unified communications uh, across a variety of sectors, is going to bring his knowledge base from 
the multiple clients that they already have at Everbridge, as well as the amount of work that they've done in other industries, to really tell us what uh, healthcare is doing well already today, or it could improve uh, using some of the uh, techniques and uh, approaches and guidance uh, that uh, Everbridge is giving its customers uh, for quite a bit of time. So let's talk about the first piece here. Uh, uh, as a writer, as a speaker, um, you know, I do a lot of uh, events uh, all across the country, and I hear from CIOs and CXOs all the time just saying, man, our, our communications infrastructure is so complex. Can't we just simplify this uh, a little bit more? Can't we get rid of this technology or get rid of that uh, uh, requirement? And really the answer is no. Uh, complexity is only going to grow. We can't really eliminate it. We've just got to figure out how we can handle it. Now, the question is, what is the it? What are we trying to handle? And this is just a very simple picture. Obviously, if you've ever worked in, in a, in a multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-institutional environment, you know it's much, much more complex than this simple picture. But it could be simple things like just saying, okay, I'm here in this part of the uh, institution, or, uh, you know, my patient uh, hasn't received his meds and he needs um, an, an update on when it might be coming in. Uh, code blues happening all the time. Uh, labs requirements coming in. As you start to look at this, um, what I work with a number of uh, our, our uh, chief executives on is how do you get a multi-device uh, communications infrastructure installed? How do you make sure that you can get things from multiple sources to multiple destinations? Again, you can't reduce those requirements. You just get, they're going to increase over time. We're not going to have fewer devices uh, in the future. We're going to have more devices, not fewer types. We're going to have more types. So how do you get multiple devices, whether it's a phone, whether it's a pager, clinical alarms coming in, nurse call systems, schedulers are sending out information. And this is all before, by the way, next generation supply chain in, gets involved, next generation uh, logistics gets, gets involved. So the idea of multiple devices, multiple sources, and multiple destination just being status quo uh, is a good place to start, but knowing that you have to integrate even more in the future. So the other problem that we have is that we tend to use different systems for different kinds of criticality. So, for example, for alarming in our medical devices, we tend to use different systems than for what we believe to be, quote, simple messaging. I mean, in, inside a hospital or inside a uh, safety critical environment, there's nothing simple about even simple messaging because if you're trying to explain uh, the communication uh, requirements around uh, a, a what a patient needs uh, from a transition of uh, one set of nurses to another, or uh, there's a logistical change between uh, supplies coming in from one group to another. There's nothing simple about those. These are all uh, going to affect uh, the safety critical nature, the life critical nature, um, and the importance doesn't go down. So how do you support multiple criticalities together in some unified way? Then there's the multiple workflows. This is probably the biggest problem in healthcare today is we have all of these different devices, different sources of data, different destinations of data, all trying to connect and combine into a single workflow, and it's very, very difficult. So as a new device gets in, you have a, a new set of users trying to figure out how do I connect this into uh, the same EHR or revenue cycle or financial management or other systems that I might have. So when you look at multiple devices, sources, and destinations, and of different criticalities, is this highly critical, is this safety critical, or is it just a, quote, simple notification, and then try to connect it via multiple workflows, this just starts to get more and more difficult over time. Now start to take into account multiple institutions and multiple stakeholders. Stakeholders could be patients. They could be the caregivers. In fact, the idea that um, caregivers want to have just as much knowledge about what's going on uh, about the uh, world of the patient as a patient does is growing more and more. So the if full patient experience is improved when the caregivers, uh, the mom of a sick child, the adult parent of uh, the adult uh, child of a uh, elderly parent, if we don't keep those caregivers directly involved and fully informed, then our patient satisfaction scores start to go down because the patient might have been informed, but their caregivers weren't. So those are the multiple stakeholders, physicians connected with nurses, nurses connected with the ancillary providers, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, supply staff connected with the surgery staff, the schedulers connected with 
everybody that needs to be uh, fully integrated. So the multi-stakeholder, multi-institution is getting to be more and more difficult. So when you look at this complexity, and, and, and I feel for uh, all of our uh, senior executives, as we start talking about the complexity, they just want the complexity to go away. But I keep saying, hey, you can't really make it go away. you got to handle it. So how do you handle it becomes a, a big question. And so what, what I'm going to talk about uh, over the next uh, few slides is, where is this complexity today and how it's actually growing? Uh, but uh, remember, as, you, as you're hearing these, if you have some questions, uh, there is a Q&A uh, section in your, um, uh, in your webinar screens. Uh, please uh, start uh, popping in some questions because uh, we're going to handle those uh, towards the latter part of this uh, presentation. We're going to leave a lot of time for that. So uh, what I ask uh, often uh, with senior executives and folks to, that are in charge of their communication systems is, how do these work in your environments? You know, when you have, uh, quote, simple notifications, uh, such as supplies having arrived, what do you do there? Do you get it as an email? Do you get it as a text message? Do you get it as a push message on a phone? Is it coming through a pager? What is the mechanism? Are you being called about it? Same thing with clinical alarms. Do you have a completely different way then uh, to hear what your clinical alarms look like? Or are you getting those through email and SMS and uh, through push notifications as well? And just these two answers alone, between notifications and clinical alarms, we hear, oh, yeah, my clinical alarms are beeping all over the place in those systems over there, and I have a set of devices that give me those clinical alarms. But my notifications are coming through email on my BlackBerry or on my iPhones or on my Windows phones or on my Android devices. The push notifications, they come in on my phones, but I never get that when I go back to my desk and see what was my push, notifi push notifications. So you start to see this problem uh, compounding is once you get to things like EHR outages, you know, how do you get notifications for when your IT systems are up and down, when a workstation has to be replaced, a mobile cart fell over, uh, et cetera. How are you getting um, a notification to say the network is down, now you need to switch to paper? Well, if everything is uh, all connected to one network and that network is down, what happens? These are all critical communications problems. And now think about the audit logs. How do you if you got if you've got five different devices you know like a like a Batman bat belt that you might have with five different devices all going off, where are the audit logs for all of these? How do you know that things are properly escalated? How do you know that when you need to do legal discovery for a potential lawsuit that you knew what came in as a simple notification versus a clinical alarm versus an i t outage versus uh, some uh, clinical message that came in from EHR to uh, the uh, physician. As you start to look at all of these, you start to think, oh, my goodness, it's a lot worse than we think it is because when things are working really well, the best case scenario is you have multiple devices giving multiple kinds of messages, et cetera. The messages may be receiving there, but you have no way of unifying them, looking at them in a central way so that when you go to your desktop, you can see what you got on your phone. When you're looking on your phone, you saw what you got on your desktop or on the mobile cart. When you're away from the office, especially roaming physicians, et cetera, how are they supposed to see these things? When, if you communicated something to a patient or the caregiver and they responded, where is that recorded for discovery or other uh, legal and compliance purposes? As you start to look at all these problems, it just gets even worse because the complexity just looks like it's never ending and it's, uh, and it's never going to get any better. Then you have uh, all of the things that are, are coming about which we don't even have in our environments today. So this is a very good article. If you haven't seen it, uh, uh, Michael Porter and Thomas Lee wrote uh, this article in Harvard Business Review back in October 2013 about the strategy that will fix health care. And the, the basic uh, premise here is exactly right, and that is, uh, the medical establishment today, and has been for decades, has been in a fee for service uh, when you, uh, from a volume driven perspective. You know, when you do services for patients, you get paid for it. However, the outcomes turn out, whatever the value might be, just didn't matter. But as we all know, we're all moving towards as, as much of a value driven, pay for performance model as possible. And so in this article, there was a discussion about organizing into integrated practice units, measuring outcomes and costs for every patient. Well, think about the communications necessary to just pull off numbers one and two. As you move to bundled payments for care cycles, 
and you tie in numbers one and two, now how do you communicate all of the bundles as one? How do you how do you keep all of the connections necessary? How do you combine all of the communications that you've done for numbers one, two, and three? Then it gets even harder. How do you integrate care and delivery across your separate facilities? In general, if you're a health system and you control your entire top to down, top to bottom vertical uh, installations in your facilities, things might be okay. But now, if you're trying to do bundle payments with uh, outcome measures and risk bearing for patients across facilities, and not all the facilities belong to you, what do you do? Now, you, uh, with number step step number five, expanding excellent uh, services across geography, it just gets harder and harder. And when you look at this. We all can see this is the future. This is not uh, something we're saying, oh, this might come 20 or 30 years from now. There are institutions that are being able to pull this off today from a business perspective, and they're counting on it. This is the most important thing for us as part of number six below is what happens to communications in this new world order? What is our enabling information technology platform that's going to allow numbers one, two, three, four, and five to occur? There's nothing simple about this. And it's only getting harder. The complexity is going to go up. So what do we end up uh, doing? And so basically all of that is the shift from volume to value. So just like you saw in this picture here, you have uh, dollar signs flowing from each institution and, and each care provider independently. What we want to move to is have one bundled, a lot, uh, maybe it's a bigger dollar amount, but it's flowing in between a group, a, a nice narrow network that we understand is working together for a common cause. That common cause, of course, is the patient. But how does our, does our, communi our communications infrastructure, our critical communications infrastructure accommodate this shift? It's a, it's, a, it's a big question. Now, again, when you look at it from a, um, from a volume and uh, value perspective, you know that there is a lot uh, of new communications that need to happen. So uh, we're gonna, all we're going to do is to say, okay, now we need to go buy this techn technology here. We need to go buy those devices there. But if we don't provide some platform, some common infrastructure, we're going to actually see a problem because, as we know, the shift from a clinical model going from treatment to chronic conditions, focusing uh, from chronic to focusing on prevention, wellness, obesity, there are going to be things that we are going to communicate with patients even before they become our patients. The whole point is to have new types of communications with them um, before uh, they need our care. Are we ready for that? So the implications are the clinical operations are shifting uh, hospital and physician-centric services to go more on information technologies to monitor, coordinate, and manage care. Well, if, you're, if you've got uh, uh, Fitbit devices and monitoring things that are going on outside, um, perhaps we've got to figure out how do we get these new transitions in care even before they become patients to start occurring as part of our communications infrastructure. So if you thought the world was hard already and, that, and you were just dealing with it with a single institution in a single facility, now you can see with, uh, with the Affordable Care Act and other things, uh, accountable care, pay for performance, and, and established uh, kinds of new uh, business models that we want to get into, it's getting a little bit worse, a little bit more complex, so it requires even better communications. Now, um, the question broadly becomes how can our communications infrastructure assist with successful transitions of care, reducing hospital readmissions, innovating uh, with new practice models like patient-centered medical homes, helping with prevention, wellness, and obesity intervention, doing behavior adjustments, helping with physician and provider marketing. How, how do we use these new technologies to say we're better at care because we keep you informed. We're better at care because uh, all of the care providers know what's going on. So it helps to personalize medicine. It helps to do total population management. And all of these things become very, very difficult. So question is now, how do our communications map to specific patient populations? If we're now managing patients even before they become patients, it means that we're doing prevention and trying to manage people in a well patient environment, in an at-risk environment, in a chronic care environment, and then acute treatment. So the last one is the one we're actually very uh, pretty good at, the acute treatment side, where it's about 4% of the population, about 36% of our cost. We think we're pretty good with that. You know, we've got our basic infrastructures in place, our devices, et cetera. But think about the chronic care. 
if the patients are outside, the caregivers are outside, how are you maintaining and managing communications with them? The at-risk side, they're not quite patients yet, but they might need some imaging and other things uh, done to help them understand they might need a little genetic test here, a little bit of outreach there. What are we going to do? The, and then the well patient becomes even harder because they're not fully engaged with us in any way. How do we make them uh, make sure that they can do healthy promotions, healthy lifestyle choices, uh, get health risk assessments? These are all great communications problems to think about. Um, the good news is that there are some solutions. The bad news is we have to rethink about, uh, a lot about uh, how we would accommodate this broad, more broadly speaking. So what do we do as leaders? Um, so as, as, I, as I talk to our CIOs, CFOs, uh, um, CMIOs, uh, nurse leaders, really you have three broad choices. Attempt to reduce the complexity, so reducing the device types and sources and destinations, or you don't, try to, you don't try to do as much. You reduce your service and offerings, or you simplify workflows. You see how we can get that going. That has not been working out too well. I mean, the, the complexity just keeps going higher and higher. Um, so the other option that a lot of uh, leaders are looking at is a best-of-breed best communications model, where you still try to reduce the types, but then you try to maintain your service offerings, and you choose multiple vendors based on criticality, one vendor for alarms, another vendor for notifications, some for push, some for SMS, a little bit of HIPAA work there, et cetera. But even that's becoming a struggle as the complexity grows, and so I'm normally recommending these days that people look at unified communications. And this is not a surprise. Uh, most major enterprises, uh, both inside and outside of healthcare, are looking at UC or unified communications because they are embracing complexity. And that's the key here. Don't give up. Embrace the complexity. Increase your service offerings because that's what your um, patients want you to do. It's what the, uh, your boards want you to do. It's what the CEO wants to do. So increasing of service offerings means you have to support all the different workflows. And as you start to support all the workflows, you start to say, okay, why would I want to buy unified messaging and unified communications? If we can buy a good technology infrastructure, it will help save lives by making sure that uh, um, high-priority messages get to the right person at the right time. And when seconds count, uh, all of this stuff matters. And unfortunately, we don't realize it many times that in a best-of-breed model, uh, the integration uh, that's necessary is fairly um, routine. I mean, you can do it. It's not, it's not uh, impossible. But you don't know whether everything is working well until the most critical time when the highest scale requirement comes. And then you find out, oh, shoot, we forgot one connection point here. Or, oh, shoot, we needed this for legal discovery and compliance, but all those messages are sitting in that other system. I don't have a way of being able to do a combined audit log. So in order to save time and money, you know, you reduce unnecessary messages, making sure you do uh, um, removal of inefficient communication modes as, as pagers over time. Instead of just saying we've got to do this all at once, you do it over time. And then trying to make sure that you integrate this into your clinical workflows becomes just an absolute necessity. How do you make sure all of this gets connected up? So buying it is actually a pretty uh, a reasonable, there's a good amount of evidence that uh, unified communication and unified messaging is a good thing. On the user side, right, on the buyer side, uh, senior executives can make these decisions pretty easily. Uh, but then getting the users to understand this and, and really deploy it becomes difficult. So we got to make sure that we have them in on the uh, on the process and make sure that they understand how does it help save lives. We help them understand how does it to help save time and money for them, not for their bosses, not for uh, other people in other departments, but for them. How can we make sure that the that, that their patient communications is uh, improved and how do we make sure that they realize that we care about their clinical workflows. We're not just going to try to give them a new unified solution that uh, looks unified and, and it saves money, but actually makes their job uh, a lot harder. So with this, what I'd like to do is, uh, at this point, uh, invite uh, uh, Imad Moline from um, Everbridge. And uh, I was really excited as, uh, as uh, Imad and I started having these conversations uh, to, to see just how much experience uh, Everbridge has in this, uh, in this unified uh, c communications world, especially given the fact that Gartner and others have given them literally one of the highest ratings that you can get there in the top right of the uh, magic quadrant in this area. And what was more important to me was not so much that they had the experience in, in unified critical communications, 
but they had it across multiple uh, environments. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, Imad, uh, welcome. I uh, just would love to have you just do a quick introduction about you and uh, and Everbridge. And then uh, if you can talk to us a little bit about uh, what Everbridge has uh, been doing in other industries and how it's brought uh, some of that knowledge into healthcare. And then, of course, you're doing a lot of work in healthcare and how you might be taking that into other industries uh, because that seems like a fairly unique uh, uh, model where you guys are doing a lot in both inside and outside of healthcare. Well, uh, first, uh, uh, thank you very much, I had It's uh, you know great presentation, and thank you for the great introduction. Um, so we here at, uh, at Everbridge have been in the unified critical communications space for quite a while now. And, and, and yes, we actually do uh, provide these services across a variety of different industries. And, you know, as you were saying initially, we see as well that complexity is going to increase. So the whole idea of just, you know, hey, just simplify everything and everything will be just fine is simply not going to fly. Right, so the whole idea behind handling, managing, even embracing complexity is actually a good thing. And one of the things that working with these multiple industries has taught us is that uh, complexity exists everywhere. The, the, the good news here for, uh, some, for most of you who are in the healthcare industry is that uh, healthcare is not necessarily the most complex. So when we work across these different industries, what we work with, for example, with the industries that may be more regulated. So when we deal with nuclear energy, for example, uh, there are more regulations surrounding potentially uh, any type of incidents and the communication surrounding it than the logging requirements, et cetera, simply because of the potential impact of any type of human or system error. Uh, in, in, in financial services, uh, something fairly similar. If you think that the most important thing when you're dealing with communication is to have everybody know as much as possible about a particular situation. Well, in some cases, like in financial services, part of the challenge is the exact opposite. You need to have these segregated um, silos where information cannot necessarily be shared and where organization gets a lot more complex and in some cases more political. Uh, when we deal with uh, public safety, again, we're still dealing with saving lives in this particular case. But all of a sudden, the scale is very different. And a lot of the questions that we have to ask is, in some cases, how do you reach not just a team, a care team of 10 people or 15, but how do you reach thousands or hundreds of thousands of people with specific instructions that can allow you to streamline how precious resources are going to be used during a fairly critical incident? So all of these different facets allow us to, in many cases, pick the appropriate best practices that can be reused uh, ultimately in, in healthcare in, in others. So again, the good news is healthcare is not the most complex or the most heavy as far as requirements for uh, either scale or instant communications or uh, workflows that might be spanning a variety of different functions. But uh, it's up there, though. Yeah, great. Uh, I, and I love that. Uh, so g g give us a few words on what do you think that word critical, uh, so you, you know, we're talking about uh, critical communications here as opposed to just unified communications. And just for the audience, uh, you know, unified communications often means making sure that your voice over IP and your um, uh, pager systems, et cetera, are all using a common system. But they may, or, they may be for inter-office use. It may be for non-critical use. So you got to be careful that uh, when we talk about healthcare or anywhere where you're talking about patient safety, uh, safety critical kinds of uh, life critical kinds of things, that we do use unified critical communications. So do you have just a, a couple of words on um, you know what what does uh, critical communications mean to uh, you with your uh, ex expertise in, in unified communications in general? Well, in, in a critical in this particular case means that lives are at stake. And certainly in the healthcare space, right? So typically it's a mission critical process in many cases, but ultimately, if the communication doesn't get through, that there is going to be a significant risk to lives and livelihoods. That's when critical really matters. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know what, we have a webinar like this ultimately and we need some type of collaboration tool and oh, by the way, if a couple of people can't get on, that's okay. Or the fact that you've sent out a an email message letting everybody know that there is a leftover birthday cake 
over in the kitchen. All right? That's a very different type of communication that can certainly be encompassed under the umbrella of unified communications, but not necessarily critical communications. However, when you're dealing with a STEMI or a code alert, right, if you're dealing with an EHR being down and you have to let everybody know, and hopefully we'll have more in-depth discussions about what to do in cases like this, then that communication becomes critical because it's affecting not just the operations of the hospital or the care unit that you're dealing with, but potentially the lives of the patients. That's critical. Great. No, I, I love it. And that, that, uh, and that distinction is very, very important because as we start to connect to doctors and patients and other staff, uh, we have to do, um, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that um, healthcare isn't the most heavily regulated, uh, and uh, that, ex that example of the uh, nuclear and energy uh, type of environment was perfect, is that we, start, we tend to start thinking, oh, my God, HIPAA is so hard. We have to do this, uh, all of this regulation kind of stuff. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, how, how do you guys uh, end up uh, maintaining and managing these kind of critical communications, but doing so in a HIPAA-compliant environment? Is that pretty easy, or is it very difficult to do? <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't call it easy. No, not, not at all, right? Certainly there are a variety of different requirements in order to be um, – uh, uh, HIPAA compliant, or you know, better yet, to enable you to be uh, HIPAA compliant, and, and 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 really, this is part of where that value that you certainly talked about can can be provided, right? Having that communication and making sure that that communication can be fostered and encouraged within the institution, between and amongst uh, providers to. Uh, 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 exchange diagnosis ideas or share care plans or even over to patients to ensure that there is enough communication to reduce and avoid uh, readmission rates. That needs to be done. And in order to facilitate that type of exchange and not be in violation of HIPAA or high tech, then of course you need to be very careful about how you communicate any type of information that might contain PHI. Of course, you know, most of us. Um, would probably have the instinct to, oh, I want to share a small piece of information with somebody. What am I going to do? I'll pick up my iPhone or my Android device and I'm going to text. It's as simple as that. But of course, if you do that, you have to be extremely careful about what information you would be able to share. Because if you share anything that might be misconstrued as PHI, then you're in violation. Not a good thing. Not only that, but of course that information may not necessarily be retained as part of an overall medical record, which is again not necessarily a good thing, depending on what you want to do. So as a matter of fact, we've run a couple of surveys and, and, and some of the data is, that's come back has been pretty interesting. Uh, about 73% of healthcare professionals that we surveyed said that, for example, communication via just email and pagers limit their productivity. Uh, it impacts their patient care. Right? And if they were able to have this type of unified critical communication while knowing that all that communication would be and could remain HIPAA compliant, that it could uh, increase their productivity and the quality of the care that they provide tremendously. And again, this is where that value ultimately that you talk about really can, can come in. Um, let's ensure that we can give HIPAA compliant um, uh, means to these care providers and their patients so they can provide uh, a better, more timely care with anything from simple messaging via text to things that might be slightly more advanced, such as uh, a care via telemedicine, for example. Right. No, that's great, and I'm glad to hear that, uh, you know, um, uh, everybody realizes it's not easy, but at least it's uh, possible. So one of the things that uh, we've discussed uh, uh, across the industry is doing a little bit more work with remote uh, care, so connecting with patients, et cetera, remote, remotely. So what, how do you guys handle things like this? I mean, this is one uh, interesting use case that we came up with, which is EMS and ER teams needing to communicate with a patient before the patient arrives. The patient hasn't yet been registered yet. Uh, you know, all of the stuff that uh, need is needed may not already be there, but we need to communicate uh, between two care teams, one that is literally moving at 65 miles an hour with the other one that's uh, stationary helping prepare for that. What, what kind of things that, uh, uh, that you guys have seen uh, in other industries could help with this kind of use case? 
Well, actually, this is one of those areas where uh, other industries may be able to help uh, or to learn, uh, certainly from healthcare in general. So especially the coordination between EMS teams and ER teams. So everything from ensuring that uh, STEMI and code alert information is actually sent uh, and sent appropriately, so all the information is included. You don't have to think about it. You press a button. There you, there's one or two fields that you need to actually fill out, and all the appropriate information is actually sent out and is ready uh, uh, for the appropriate uh, team as the patient is coming in to uh, ensuring that if need be, if there is going to be a, 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 a certain amount of time that can be uh, taken advantage of in the ambulance, that the appropriate uh, level of telemedicine is available on a um, on, on a, on a cost-effective and efficient basis to actually start the care and certain aspects of the care long before the patient even arrives at the ER. So in, in many cases, uh, there are some best practices in the healthcare industry that are ahead of where some of the other industries are and that others can actually leverage quite a bit. But again, the idea behind minimizing errors is something that needs to be focused on. Uh, how can you minimize the amount of interaction that the people who are going at 65 miles an hour, literally, right, are going to have to input or enter into a system to ensure that everything that needs to be done for that patient in transit and after the fact has been taken care of. So knowing ahead of time the types of workflows that need to be automated, the minimal amount of information that needs to be entered into a system so that you can be doing something else with that patient across the board is critical. Minimizing those errors basically means that you may have template-driven ways of doing communications that require very little interaction and then can track the appropriate status of the patient, of the overall incidents around the patient throughout um, that patient's care. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so w when you look at this, uh, you know, so much of healthcare is uh, a human resource problem. I mean, just uh, intermediating and getting people to uh, understand who's on what shift. And as you move from shift to shift, uh, getting folks to understand uh, who's doing what becomes uh, quite difficult. So I know that uh, um, some of the use cases that you guys have looked at uh, are, are about these uh, managing of shifts and making sure you know who's doing what when. Can you talk a little bit about that, and why, why would this be considered a communications problem? I mean, this seems like a scheduling or a, a nurse management, nurse call system problem. Why would this be important in a, in a critical communications type of environment, and, and, and how should people accommodate this in their planning for, for, for this kind of uh, uh, task? Well, actually, this is an extremely critical part of a unified critical communications system, because when you're trying to communicate about a patient, you're not necessarily communicating directly with Joe the nurse or Sarah the cardiologist. What you're doing is discussing or communicating about that particular patient. And whoever happens to be on call for a particular function or service is always changing and it could be changing based on who's busy, but also based on schedules across the board. So in some cases, what I want to know is, who is the cardiologist who happens to be on duty right now? Who's the attending who happens to be on call right now? Who's going to be getting that message? And what happens if that particular uh, doctor does not respond within 90 seconds or two minutes? What then? depending on the situation, depending on the type of code alert that it is, depending on the type of issue that we have, what is it that should happen? Who's the next person that needs to be communicated with that has the appropriate qualifications to handle this very situation? If I want to do a consult, who am I going to go ahead and communicate with and request that consult from? Should I go to a paper process and a paper schedule and start calling one at a time until somebody answers? Or could it be completely and totally automated? And again, the question that you have here on the screen, if I have several vacant shifts based on a particular issue, what am I going to do? Should I look at yet another 
uh, paper schedule or go look at an exchange server and then start calling each one of these nurses one at a time? Or can I just push a button and have a system determine that here are the appropriate people who are not actually in right now, who are not on duty right now, and who've got the right qualifications, and oh, by the way, I need to call them in a particular sequence based on seniority or potentially in some cases union rules or whatnot. Let the system handle it with the push of a button and bring back all of that information. That's why it's critical. The fact that uh, 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 individual people's qualifications, schedules are part and parcel of that unified critical communication makes it an absolute must-have. Right. Uh, yeah, great point. Uh, so I guess uh, similar to that are, are these problems that we have when uh, IT systems uh, and, and things like that uh, need to supply uh, information across uh, facilities. So uh, you guys have done um, uh, emer emergency preparedness uh, before, uh, especially in other industries uh, such as uh, police and community style. Um, how much of this really applies to the hospitals themselves? How should they participate in community type of uh, emergency preparedness? Uh, uh, is that a, a big thing that they should be working on, a small thing? How do you recommend that they accommodate uh, emergency preparedness? Well, in, in, in the, the, if, if, if there is a potential emergency that, that may endanger all staff members, it, it becomes an issue, of course. And this is, again, where um, if you're trying to do notifications manually, they're going to be certainly time-consuming. They may be very much error-prone. I need to evacuate an entire hospital, for example, because of a gas leak or other issue. Unfortunately, we've heard way too many uh, uh, situations, uh, uh, certainly here, in, in, not far from where we are in the Boston area, of um, uh, uh, active shooters in a healthcare facility. What do you do in this particular case, whether you're dealing with a healthcare facility or whether you're dealing with an overall area where a particular system might um, be overwhelmed, such as what happened in the Boston Marathon bombing and where area hospitals were certainly very much capable of handling the influx of new patients, but where communication played an incredibly important part. Right. Okay. So Very good. And and I yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. And and I guess when when you extend that a little bit, you know, whether you're talking about notifying for emergencies uh, outside, uh, then you've got the issue of notifying for all kinds of different emergencies. Like one emergency is, hey, my clinical system uh, has gone down. Uh, so when you when you look at that uh, particular kind of uh, use case. Uh, this is normally considered IT uh, kinds of uh, uh, updates. So why wouldn't people end up just using this in their um, support systems? Why would this be part of a uh, critical infrastructure, critical communications infrastructure, uh, instead of just using their internal IT systems to do these updates? Uh, well, uh, you know, it was kind of funny because I, I was with a fairly major hospital system uh, not too long ago, and, and they were describing their process on the IT side to me, and you know, kind of recognized the fact that hey, you know what, we had our system, our, our, our email go down um, not too long ago, and um, what we did is we sent out an email letting people know that that happened, and um, you know, the CIO after a while thought about it, and said, oh, that probably wasn't the right thing to do. So you know, for us. The, this is what, what unified is all about, right? We're not just unifying the fact that you can reach uh, somebody via phone or via text or via push notification or via pager or via PA announcement. That's certainly one aspect of unified communications. This is the other aspect of it, where various workflows, whether they happen to be on the clinical side or on the IT side, can all be managed in similar fashions. You know. A couple of slides ago, we talked about schedules. Well, schedules that are managed as part of a unified critical communications platform aren't just about um, doctors and nurses who are on duty or figuring out who the attending is. They also have to do with the people who are supporting all of these different systems. Right? So if, if an EHR does go down or if email does go down, what is it that needs to happen? Well, there are workflows that impact both the IT team you know, how bad is the problem, what's the severity, what's the overall impact uh, across the board. Let's ensure that 
every nurse on every floor is going to be told that the EHR is down, for example. Or let's go and have an, a, a communication that goes out to everybody who happens to be in the building right now or happens to be on duty right now. Certainly you can do that, right? That might impact your clinical workflow. But at the same time, depending on the severity and the impact, you may want to have a very different type of an escalation policy for your IT team, right? Is this an all hands on board? Do you actually make phone calls to people's landlines at home at 2 a.m. because it's that important and because we weren't able to fix this, the issue with the staff that we had on hand at the hospital at that time? How critical is this issue? How do you make that decision? How do you make that decision in the heat of the moment when you have patients coming in and you have no way of admitting them or you have to fall back to a paper-based process? So how do you automate, escalate all of your IT incident response? And again, what is the impact on all of your clinical workflows in this case? Who needs to know? Because again, the ultimately, as you said it before, it's all about the patient. It's all about the quality of care that we're going to be delivering. And this is part of how we deliver that care, even for in the minds of some people, no, 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 we're dealing with an IT system in this case. Right. Yeah, and I think you see the same problem, uh, for example, when uh, you start looking at uh, clinical alarms. So, you know, people say, okay, well, this is should be in my help desk system and then clinical alarms are in my device system and my uh, patient communications, my HIPAA stuff is in some text messaging system. And so talk a little bit about uh, um, how you guys have looked at uh, unifying uh, telemetry, alarms, et cetera, uh, in this area, because I think it's a similar problem to the scheduling question as well as a similar problem to what we talked about uh, with the IT side. And then, uh, you know, as soon as you finish this up, uh, we're going to open up for questions. So I'd just like to remind the audience again that uh, uh, questions are open. Please do start uh, um, uh, pro providing that. We're going to leave about uh, 10 minutes uh, l at the last uh, part of this uh, webinar to go ahead and uh, answer your direct questions. So with this, uh, you know, um, Imad, I'd just love to hear, you know, what, 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 this seems to be the most critical of all critical things, like an alarm uh, uh, is probably just slightly even more critical than an EHR going down. So talk about this and how you're managing this in your uh, customers today. Well, you know, in a way, this is one of those um, uh, scenarios where everything comes together, right? There is some automation in here. You've got some type of a multi-parameter bedside diagnostics monitor, for example, or some type of alarm that actually comes in. What is it that's supposed to happen in this case? Well, again, depending on the type of alarm that it is, and depending on the overall severity, what we might want to do is ensure that the nurse um, uh, who's on uh, duty right now on that floor knows about it. What if he happens to be on break right now? Uh, what should happen? Well, there should be an overall escalation across the board. And in every single one of these cases, all of the information must be secured and HIPAA compliant when it's being distributed to any of these recipients across the board. Depending on the type of alarm that it is, again, the appropriate members of the care team would need to be notified. In some cases, some of the care team members um, can be very numerous, but some of them might be on call and some of them may not be. So you start with the ones who were on call. And again, depending on the severity of the issue, you might give them a certain amount of time, but then move on to the next ones. Ultimately, you need people to be able to respond as quickly and effectively as possible. And, and you know, the picture might be a little bit misleading here because it's not just about the bedside monitors anymore. Ultimately, when you talk about, uh, uh, ultimately, the, 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 the transitioning from uh, a fee-for-service to value, you know, you mentioned yourself a little while back, um, you know, we might all be wearing some type of Fitbit devices. The, the fa fact is we're seeing more and more of these types of diagnostic devices being employed and deployed uh, for patients uh, across the board, especially when dealing with things like chronic disease management. Well, what if, again, you could take that type of information and ensure that a very similar type of workflow takes place, whereas the information could be actually sent securely, and depending on the time of alarm, that the care team members, whoever happens to be on duty at that time, because we're looking at schedules, et cetera, are um, informed of any uh, of the particulars of that particular situation and alarm and can act accordingly. So whether, again, it's a bedside monitor or whether it's a a chronic patient who's walking about and wearing some type of diagnostics monitor where it's now or in the future, 
that type of workflow, that type of automation is going to be absolutely critical in helping improve both patient care and safety and ultimately delivering the right kind of value in the long term for patients and uh, healthcare providers alike. Yeah, that's great. And and as we as we've seen over the last uh, probably eight or ten questions that I've asked you, uh, you know, it, it seems like there is, it is possible uh, to reduce complexity in one way, and that is instead of a half dozen systems, maybe a best of breed, et cetera, that it is possible to have a, a single platform. So if you can just talk, uh, you know, maybe thirty seconds or so about this unified critical communication system that you guys offer from the Everbridge uh, perspective. Uh, and how that might uh, um, be applicable to a, a, a lot of our audience here. We'll then open it right up uh, for questions. Uh, John, you'll take over right after that uh, and uh, maybe uh, give us some of the initial questions. Yeah, you know, happy to talk about it. Again, unified uh, uh, communications platform where all of the different things that you may need as part of a uh, uh, either a, a clinical or operational workflow or part of it. So whether you need to do communications to all of your uh, staff and employees and clinicians uh, within just a, a, a few seconds and make sure that you can hit them appropriately on their uh, pagers and, and, and SMS and make phone calls, et cetera, whether it's IT alerting systems that go down at the same time, you have to, again, notify the people on the clinical side as well as the IT team to come and deal with it, whether you're dealing with a code alerts where you want to reduce errors. So again, if it's a code blue, or a code black, it doesn't really matter. You have two or three different fields that you need to uh, punch or pull down on a particular user interface and it takes care of the rest. It'll look at schedules, it'll look at who's um, there, it'll look at all the information from a patient-centric perspective. And of course, the scheduling that's part of it as well as the HIPAA compliance because anytime you're limited by not being able to share PHR for fear of non-compliance, you're probably going to impact the patient care negatively. So all of that can be had in a single software as a service platform where all of these things ultimately revolve around that common cause, the patient. Great. Uh, so, John, um, uh, any questions have come in uh, that uh, we want to start handling now? Yeah, uh, we've got uh, several that have come in. Um, we wrapped up there talking about the patient. I think this next one might be uh, along that same vein, and I can go out to, uh, to Ahmad. But the question was, how does a connected hospital prevent readmissions? So the, the um, you know the answer can be either simple or complex. Uh, let me give you the the uh, the, the simple uh, uh, version of it, right? Um, we, as part of actually that survey that I mentioned before, we talked about uh, to a huge number of healthcare professionals. About 46% of them said that high risk readmissions can be prevented, not just reduced, if you had secure communications across the board. You know, so if you could communicate with the patient, give them the appropriate discharge instructions, if they can communicate back to you and you can have the appropriate type of telemedicine so they didn't necessarily have to come in, but you can have that overall consultation in a way that was HIPAA compliant, you could go a long way towards reducing or even eliminating these readmissions. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, another question, um, and I believe this one could be for either of you, is uh, what are some of the drivers and benefits of a connected hospital? We had talked in some pretty specific terms through this presentation. Uh, just looking for some, maybe some more clarification. Um, you know, why do it, and what are the benefits of it ultimately? Yeah, maybe I'll start, and then uh, I'll hand it over to Imad. I, I think the, the the main thing is that we are being asked, uh, broadly speaking, uh, not, not just for uh, just single health systems, but broadly speaking, to do more for patients than we've ever done before. And in order to do more, such as, you know, whether it's on the readmission side or as, as simple as that, as that is in certain cases, it's very complex in others, we're being asked to do prevention, we're being asked to do uh, wellness management, we're being asked to do chronic care, as you start to look at all of these extensions of services, it's just not possible unless we do a better job of coordinating communications. And whether that's a, you know, a single solution like a unified uh, communication system or a unified critical communication system uh, specifically, we know we have to do much better coordination of communication. So from a planning perspective, we as leaders need to figure out and say, if my boss has asked me to do more, if my board is asking us to do more, if our community is asking us to do more, can we do that if we don't have 
a good, solid way of making sure that we can coordinate staff to act on behalf of patients in some meaningful ways. If we don't know how to do that, what are we going to do in, this, in these cases? And that's where I think a, a solution like an Everbridge makes a ton of sense because it's, some, it's somewhat ready-made, ready to roll, could hand, accommodate a number uh, of areas. It's not 100%. It's not going to be perfect for everybody uh, in all solutions, um, but it, it does mean that we can do more just like our bosses are asking us to do. So uh, any, any uh, additions or elaboration on that, uh, Imad? Well, I'll go back to one of the things that you started this whole conversation with, which is the complexity, the complexity that cannot be eliminated. And as a matter of fact, that needs to be handled and even embraced because things are going to get more complex. There is going to be more regulation. There are going to be more devices that are out there and higher expectations from patients, you know, as they increase the, you know, self-diagnostics, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you actually handle all of that? Well, again, what if you could ensure that all of your staff information, that you have five or six different ways of contacting every staff member. You don't have to actually think about it. But depending on the appropriate situation that uh, it has arisen based on a, uh, a, a, a particular uh, issue, such as um, a patient coming in to the ER and you're communicating with your um, uh, EMS uh, colleagues, or whether it's about uh, chronic disease prevention. If you knew that, all of that communication could be done and you don't necessarily have to think about that coordination. Wouldn't that make things easier? You had all of your staff's information and profiles, all of their schedule across the board. At the core of it all, the provider to patient relationship and all of the workflows around them are already predefined and predetermined so that the information flows to the appropriate people without you having to think about it. Wouldn't then wouldn't we be able to then focus on the quality of care on the patient quite a bit better? Great. I think we have time for one more question. John? We've got one more here then. Uh, what are the benefits of having the care team connected on a single solution? Imad, I'll let you handle that. All right. So the, the, the benefits here, of course, are that you don't have to go to five or six or seven different systems, in many cases, trying to think about on one particular system uh, who is actually connected to it uh, from a paging perspective, from a secure messaging perspective, if I have to go to a different system, do I have all of the right staff members and doctors and nurses and care team members on that as well? And if I do need to go and look at uh, uh, schedules, do I have to go to yet another third system? How much time are you going to have to spend going from system to system to system just to have uh, a meaningful conversation about this particular patient, especially if time is of the essence? If you could simply say, I'm going to um, a deal with this overall patient with the appropriate care team without ever worrying about which system anyone might be on or which system is secure and HIPAA compliant and which one isn't. Or if I go on this system, may I, would I be in danger of sending a notification or a message to somebody who's not on call at the time and therefore I'm going to have to waste my time chasing down who the right person is. If the system simply knew and whether you're paging somebody or evacuating a building or letting them know that a lab is ready or asking for a consult or starting a telemedicine video call, if it could all be the same system, wouldn't the benefit be fairly evident? That's great. Uh, no, I, lo I love that. Uh, so uh, I think we're uh, running out of time. John, do you want to uh, make any uh, final comments and then we can conclude? Yeah, I, I just want to remind you that uh, you will be receiving uh, the listeners a uh, email with uh, links to where this is going to be archived. Um, and I want to thank Shahid and Ahmad both uh, for not only providing a great deal of information, but a great deal of quality information. Um, and and uh, thank you, the listener, for uh, joining us. And uh, you know, hope everybody has a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks, all.